Hey, all you readers out there, it's Mark Shapiro, New York Times bestselling author. Just had a great interview done. I was so booking cool. And whenever you're interested in what's going on in the literary world, check out So Booking Cool. You won't be disappointed. Welcome to So Booking Cool. I'm Jewel B. And today we are joined by Mark Shapiro, who is the New York Times bestselling author as well as a journalist. And today we are here to talk about his many books, including Renaissance Man, the Lynn Manuel Miranda story, an unauthorized biography, which So Booking Cool did recently review. And we we absolutely loved it. So, Mark, how's it going? And when did you conceive the idea for Renaissance Man to put the Lynn Manuel Miranda story together? Well, I I think it was timing. Lynn Miranda, Manuel Miranda was on everybody's lips. Uh, I mean, Hamilton was a was a monster hit. Uh, and uh, bottom line was people just wanted to know about it and about him. And uh, what struck me as, as attractive to his character is he was a, a self-made celebrity. Uh, no scandal, no no problems, no problems growing up. He was quite simply somebody who had a dream and a passion and was willing to do whatever he had to do to get it. And if you know his history at all, it took him a number of years. But uh, persistence, creativity, and uh, timing and luck, that's what turned him into the man he is today. And while you were writing Renaissance Man, did you find yourself at all inspired or like did you react any way to any of the findings that you had about his life well uh, i've always been attracted to creative people and uh i found interesting the fact that he was uh fairly normal i mean you hear about creative people always having these issues and this and that but you know he grew up in a a sane home two loving parents who by nature of their influence uh, in the way of music and uh, theater and things of that nature, uh, pretty much inspired him to take off on his own. Uh, grew up in a good neighborhood. Uh, he was very aware racially who he was and who he was about and how he would be treated, which helped him get uh, you know get involved in uh, theater. Uh, he grew up in a very creative environment. Uh, schools he went to were all creatively and arts oriented and uh, he was encouraged every step of the way and in that in the creative world can be unusual in and of itself because a lot of people don't necessarily understand the creative mind whether it's writing or theater or music but he was very lucky he had people behind him all the way and inspired him and encouraged him and uh we have Hamilton now. Yes, exactly. So how would you say his story, just in terms of the execution of it, how does it differ from the J.K. Rowling story that you did, which, you know, is a New York Times bestseller? You've also written about Justin Bieber and Selena Gomez and, and many others, many, many others. <laughs> J.K. Rowling as well, she's self-made. People would even say Justin Bieber self-made as well. So, yeah, just... Tell us about the the process when you're writing about creatives and self-made people and who are famous. Right. Uh, first thing is research, lots of research. Uh, you check previously published things. Uh, you track down people who knew him or knew them when, uh, hopefully to get some insights. Uh, in the case of Lin-Manuel Miranda, I did actually get one of his uh school teachers from way back in the day to talk about him and, you know, how he was in school, what kind of a student, that kind of thing. Uh, when you're doing these kind of books, uh, people, I try to get into the head of people who are going to be buying the book, what questions they might have, you know, in the case of Lin-Manuel Miranda, how did he become who he became? What, were, what was his story like? How does it inspire people? And that's pretty much... The way it goes with, I would say, 90% of the people I've written about over the years have said, what makes them tick? That's the main thing. Tick. You know, uh, what, what goes on in their head? What makes them do, it's aspire to do the things that they do? What are you currently working on as well? Because I know you mentioned that, you know, the life of the writer is, a, is you know, like a roller coaster. So can you reveal, like, are you you're working on your next book, right? 
uh, working on my finishing up my next book, which I think I'm probably safe to say is going to be on the latter life of Senator John McCain. That's right. Right. That book is is just about completed now. Uh, as soon as I finish with that one, I'm jumping into another one that I'm. It's 180 degrees away from John McCain, but I'm not quite at liberty to say yet. Okay. But if you can imagine, if you can imagine 180 degrees from John McCain, that's what it's going to be. How is it like bouncing from two like very different types of people when you're writing their stories? It's fun. I mean, it's a challenge. Uh, you know, anybody who says it's impossible to write about Justin Bieber and then write about George Harrison and then write about Carlos Santana and then write about, you know, Selena Gomez and, and then write about most recently, uh, I did Norman Reedus from the Walking Dead TV series. I did a book on him. Uh, I did a book on Mary Tyler Moore. Uh, I did a, one book I'm particularly proud of, and if anybody's out there interested in music, I, I did a departure from writing a biography about somebody to writing a biography about a song. Wow. Uh, any rock and rollers in the audience who know the song Hey Joe, uh, I have a book out there right now that is the entire history of the song. Track down people who claim they wrote the song, did the history. Uh, it's one of the most covered songs in pop music. And uh, if you want a real kick, and if you're into that kind of music, that's the way to go. That's amazing. That's amazing. Who is the publisher? Uh, the publisher for the Hey Joe book is Riverdale. The publisher for the Mary Tyler Moore book is Riverdale. Uh, if you want to go back a ways, the publisher for George Harrison and Carlos Santana, St. Martin's. Oh, my and uh, I've been pretty lucky overall because a lot of my books have, have had pretty good success overseas, too. I actually had one book published in Russia. Oh, wow. Yeah, which book is that? Let us know. It was, it was, it's a book I did initially for Riverdale, but they sold the overseas rights. It was the biography of E.L. James, who wrote the Fifty Shades of Grey books. You did a biography on E.L. James? Yes, I did. What was that like? Uh, a lot of research and a lot of trying to track people down. When you do these kind of books, your first step is to try to get people close to them. Uh, sometimes that's being celebrity being what it is today. Sometimes it's a lot easier said than done. Um in that case, I found a lot of real interesting research on her process from going from a complete unknown to writing three of the biggest books in the history of the planet, you know? And uh, it, it's, it's a challenge. Every book is a different challenge. Uh, the Hey Joe book, I got real lucky. I, I found a lot of people who were still alive who were willing to talk about it and talk to some people from very famous bands who actually recorded a version of the song. And, uh, you know, it's it's fun. It's like some days it's a pain in the butt to make a living doing this, but more often than not, it's it's fun. It's like you're doing what you love to do and actually making a living and getting paid for it. Uh, one other thing, I, just in passing, mm -hmm. uh, my fr after writing approximately 80 nonfiction celebrity books, uh, my first collection of short fiction pieces has just come out. It's called Stories of High Strangeness. It's a short story collection. You can get it at Copy Pasta Publishing. And the best way to describe it, it's a very adult collection of horror, science fiction, fantasy, and just unclassifiable stories. And I, have to, I make a point of saying with that book up front that it is very adult. So if you're of a certain sensibility, you might want to think twice. But if you're brave... It's out there. You can get it. You, it seems like you do it all, Mark. Uh, very early on in my in my life and career, I had an editor at a newspaper I worked at who told me the best way to make a living is to be able to do a lot of different things. If you're working full-time and you can do five different things, uh, chances are you won't be the first one fired if they have to cut back. And he was a, his was a real good learning experience because on this weekly paper – I did sports. I covered council meetings. Uh, a couple of times there was big riots in town, and I was the only one that looked like I could get in and cover the riot and not get killed, so they sent me for that. Uh, I was actually an astrologer for a short period of time with that same paper, and 
this is going to sound a little bit cynical, but uh, the editor came to me and said, we need somebody to write a horoscope for our paper for a little while, and we'll give you five bucks a week extra on your paycheck. Mm. Um, I'm not trying to age myself, but this was back in the days when an additional five bucks actually meant something. Right. Okay. So, so, you know, my advice to anybody that wants to write for a living, number one, mm -hmm. just do it. If it's your passion, if it's something you would do for nothing, if you could have your bills paid any other way, do it. Uh, it's a tough racket. I mean, you, I still get rejected on some of my fiction stuff all the time. But uh, if you want to do it bad enough and you want to do it for the right reasons, you know, I would say go for it. And would you say that learning how to pitch and being good at pitching is an important part, too? It's a very important part. If you've got a good idea, uh, you've got to learn how to craft a pitch letter or a couple of pages that basically sells your idea to either an agent or a publisher or both. Um, over the years, I've gotten, I'd like to say, pretty good at it. Uh, you know, some days you, you give it your best shot, and for whatever reason, you know, the story may be great, but the timing or the publication or or what for whatever reason, sometimes it doesn't work. But, uh, you know, you just go on to the next. That's You can't, if you're going to be in anything in the creative world, mm -hmm. you can't let it get you down when you get rejected. I know some people who have real, who are in the business or are trying to make it as writers and artists and all that, who have fairly thin skins, and I tell them, you can't worry about that. I mean... The, a perfect example is the Lynn Miller and Weld Miranda book. Uh, I got a some recent review that basically shredded my book, hated it, he absolutely hated it. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, I looked at it and I said, okay. And I'm not. A, I'm a, I like to get good reviews. I'm not going to lie to you, but it's like if something in that book makes him dump on it like that, you know, this is America. So he's, he's, he's free to say whatever he wants. I have never put a whole lot of stock in reviews, good or bad. Again, obviously, I love getting good reviews, and the one you guys gave me made my day, and I appreciate that. Oh. But, you know, all I want is people to, you know, take give a shot to it, you know, read the thing. If you like it, you like it. If you don't, you don't. And, you know, go on to the next. That's very fair. Yeah, and trust me to all the listeners. And I did. I also got good feedback from other people who are, like, they've become so interested in the book. Like, you, you, have, you have to read it. And what I love, too, about Renaissance Man is that it's not like a salacious, cheap, like celebrity book. And I know for some people that's that's what's really entertaining for them. But this book yeah. is so entertaining without having to do any of that, you know. And that was a joy for me because I've done those other kind of books. I did a book on Lindsay Lohan a few years ago, and that was literally like writing a train wreck. If you know anything about Lindsay Lohan, you know what her life has been like. But, you know, even in cases like that, the bottom line, you, you give people the truth. If Lindsay Lohan is a train wreck and she's done all these horrible things, you know, don't make up stories. But if this is the truth, this is the truth. You know, just put it in there and people are going to make of it what they will. I did a, a second Justin Bieber book, which was kind of along the lines of, the, of a Lindsay Lohan book that, uh, you know, it did okay but didn't do as good as the first one because it was basically focused on – you know, Justin Bieber turns 18 and becomes a monster because he doesn't have his stuff together. And, uh, you know, people bought it, but it didn't do anywhere near what the first one did. So, you know, it, it, these, doing these kind of books is a crapshoot. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you have the best hopes for a book and nothing happens. Sometimes, like with the J.K. Rowling book, I mean, that was on the bestseller list of the New York Times for four weeks. And if I never do anything else again, I've always got that memory. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, you know, it's part of the it's part of the game you play when you write for a living. You got to take the good and the bad. Okay, so two two things. First, quickly. Sure. Um, well, I mean, if, if if the timing and everything else was right, and my agent said let's do another one, mm -hmm. then you know I'd be up for it. I mean, he's had enough going on in his life lately. There's probably enough there for a third book. Um, I, it basically hadn't crossed my mind to do one, but uh, one of the things I learned as a writer, especially early on when I was starting out, uh, don't say no to anything and worry about making a go making something work after you get the deal. Mm -hmm. Okay. I mean, and that may that may sound a little bit cynical, but 
you know, if somebody offers you a deal to write a book and you maybe know a little bit about the subject but not all of it, take it and then research your, your you know what off. And that's a big part of the, and under any circumstances. Research, research, research. You're going to spend a lot of time getting the facts and getting the facts straight. Right. Yeah. And the, the only reason why I asked if you would do another was just because, like you said, there has been there's been a yet another transformation, which I think would be interesting. But, yeah, tell us about where were you when you found out that your J.K. Rowling book went to number one? Uh, I got a call from my agent mm -hmm. and I that I pretty much get the New York Times on Sunday anyway. But I got a call from my agent and then. A big bottle of wine from the publisher appeared, and I figured, well, something must be going on. They're not ready to say something bad. And it turned out that was the day it was the first uh, went out, got the New York Times, and there it was in the book review section. Wow. And obviously for the next few weeks I was following it. I mean, it went up a little bit, it went down a little bit, but ultimately it was on there for four solid weeks. And when, you, when you're working on your work as well as your fiction, but with the nonfiction, do you gather the research first and then you start writing? Uh, some people do that, and I've been known to kind of get some things together before I start writing. But I've gotten into doing both at the same time. If I have an idea of how to start the book, you can always punch in information later. With a lot of my books, I'm on deadlines. I mean, the very nature of celebrity biographies, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of times you kind of have to strike while the iron is hot. It's like with Lynn Went, Manuel Miranda, I had a little bit more time. But uh, over the years, I've done books anywhere from three weeks to six or seven months. Uh, the, the one I did in three weeks goes back a ways. It was when the movie Titanic came out, and everybody thought the movie was going to drop dead. And the movie came out on a Friday, and by Monday they knew it was a smash. My agent called me and said, I've got a publisher that wants a Titanic fact book. I said, okay, when do they want it? And I said, they, my agent said, in three weeks. So uh, for three weeks, I wrote 50,000 words. Wow. Didn't see much of my wife for three weeks, but by that time she understood what was going on. And I wrote it. And that one wound up on the LA Times bestseller list for four weeks. What is your advice for a nonfiction writer and then a fiction writer? Okay, basically both. My advice for both would be essentially the same. Number one, write. Write whatever you feel like writing about it. Don't let anybody dissuade you from writing a certain kind of thing. Write what appeals to you. I've written comic books over the years mm -hmm. because I thought it would be a kick to do. I, I'm a published poet, and I actually have some poetry coming out shortly in a couple of magazines. Um, basically, just write, write, write every day. And when you're not writing, read. And again, it's the same same situation. Read anything and everything. Mm. I read nonfiction. I read fiction. I read poetry. I read comic books. And uh, you know, basically, just write and read, write and read. It's a long process. You might get lucky early on and get a few things published, but you you got to be in this for the long haul. If you're in it to make a million dollars and have groupies chasing after you, you're going to be solely disappointed. If you're in it because you, it's something you just quite simply have to do, to, then you do it. And uh, anybody who hears this and says, well, that sounds pretty simple, it's got to be harder than that. And it really isn't. The only difference I have found is that when you're writing, you've got to separate yourself from the business side. But you definitely have to keep the business side on your mind at all times. Uh, when you write, you're being creative, but you got to realize there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of books, new titles that come out every year. Mm -hmm. um, not all of them are going to get read. Not all of them are going to get promoted or marketed. Not all of them are going to do well. Some are do well. Some will do okay. Some, but the main thing from the business point of view, you got to, as the writer, you've got to put on the business hat. You've got to make yourself available to anybody who wants to review the book, to anybody who wants to interview you, uh, you got to be able to do that too. Because there's a lot, there's, a, there's almost a, a cliche vision of the writer as living in an ivory tower and just sending down the stories and and the books getting published and the writer doesn't do anything. Well, maybe years ago they could get away with that. I mean, I'm sure Hemingway probably wasn't on the phone 24/7 doing interviews, although who knows. 
but uh, you've got to be able to make yourself out, get yourself out there, so your book will stand out from the rest of them. And that's on a, on a that's on a major la- publishing house level. That's on a an indie level. It's on a literary book publishing level. It's however you have to be able to do that. If you, you can, you, you have to be able to do both, and you have to be able to separate both. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't want to be thinking creative thoughts necessarily when you're doing, you know, five or six interviews in a day. Which I actually, years ago, when I did a book on Adele, uh, I got I had a mini phone interview tour where I did eight interviews in about three and a half hours. Wow! And and you know, you got you just got you got to remember your talking points. You got to think in terms of what's going to interest people uh you basically that you have to do that i know a lot of writers will probably say well i don't want to do that well then you're missing out on exposure and exposure is a big part of this racket so is it hard to break into like entertainment journalism would you say entertainment journalism is like everything else uh oh. any subject it's politics it's going to be anything it could be you know professional crossword puzzle writers but uh, I know I got a, I'm a I'm a little older than probably the a lot of the readers you've got and so this some of this may not register but when I was in college back in the early 70s after I got out of the army uh, I was writing for things like the local underground papers we have the LA Free Press out here I was doing freelance writing for them uh there was a bunch of bunch of uh writing uh being done in these Music magazines. We had magazines out here like Zoo World and Phonograph Record Magazine and Rock Around the World. Uh, that's where I kind of learned a lot of this stuff. I wrote a lot about music and rock and roll for a bunch of papers that, you know, kept me afloat. And uh, you know, it's you, the bottom line is you go where you go what your passion is. I'm I'm a big music fan, and that kind of led into that. But I also learned, you know. If somebody wants you to cover a council meeting, you can make 15 or 20 bucks, you know, do it. Mm -hmm. By the way, do you ever think a rate is too low for, for like a freelance article? Like, is it, would, would it ever be too low or it doesn't matter as long as it pays? Well, I'll tell you, as I've gotten older in this business, my philosophy has probably changed quite a bit. Uh, Mm -hmm. There was a time where I would work, for as little, for I would string for a couple of newspapers for as little as ten cents a column inch, and on a good day I might make three or four bucks off of that one story. Uh, these days, and this is just me, and and I would not begin to say you have to do what I say on this, but I've gotten to the point now where I will work depending on the project for very little, but I will not work for nothing. And I realize this could be a little bit controversial for a lot of people who might read this or hear this but uh uh the idea of working for exposure or copies or things like that Mm -hmm. uh that isn't going to pay the bills i'm not saying don't do it once or twice i actually have done not recently but i have done things where i did but i had a reason for it uh an example being a few years ago uh, I had a story except a short story accepted for an anthology, and he, the publisher, was a little squirrely, and he kind of, he said, "I'll give you twenty five bucks for the story." I said, it's "Sold." And then he comes back about a week later, and he was having financial problems, <clears throat> mm. and uh, he said, "I'd like to publish the story, but I can't give you any money." But and I was about ready to pull the story, but then there was, I don't know. If you're familiar with the writer, the late writer Charles Bukowski, it's he does sound familiar. Okay, he, he, read Charles Bukowski. It's like once in a lifetime experience. He died in the early '90s, but for my money, one of the greatest writers on the history of the world. Mm-hmm. And it turns out he had a a story in the same anthology. And the idea that I would have a story in the same anthology with Charles Bukowski, it meant so much to me on a personal level mm-hmm. that I did it for nothing. And that was the last time I ever did it. I mean, I, when you write poetry, try to make a living as a poet, you know, if you get four or five bucks a poem, that's, you know, considered pretty good. Uh, short stories, it depends. But, you know, personal opinion, if you don't, if you're not going to write for nothing, you're going to fall into that trap a lot of a lot of people will write just because they want to get 
things published and exposure and all that. Mm -hmm. But if you're serious about making a career out of it, you've got to stop that at a certain point. Uh, I, it, you know, and each person is different. They might, each person might have a different rate. Uh, I'm fortunate to have a, probably one of the best agents on the planet, Lori Perkins, who's been my agent for, God, it's been over 20 years now. Ooh. And, uh, She's done well by me. Like I said, I own my own home, and that's all, totally off of writing. So <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it, it, it all depends. I mean, it, it's not like I'm trying to dodge this. It's just it, it, each individual is different. You may get ten people write in and say, well, if I can get something published, I'll do it for nothing. Well, I say more power to you. Hopefully you'll have an, a way of paying the bills when the rent's due. Yeah. And And that sounds a little facetious, but, I mean, you know, you got to think realistically. I mean, if you're just doing it as a hobby writer or just somebody who likes to get their poems in a small lit magazine or something, that's fine. I would I would never put you down for that. But if you're looking to make a, a serious living and have a pretty good life, uh, you know, you got to think business like. You got to think money. But uh, again, never let that get in the way of the creativity because when you're sitting down at your computer by yourself in your office. You've got to be thinking totally from the mind and the heart what you're doing. So I know you mentioned your advice is for people to read a lot, like writers and stuff. What exactly do you think we should – books but articles as well? Everything. You should, okay. you should read books, articles, books of all kinds. I, like I said, I read biography, biographies and fiction. Uh, read comic books. I mean, it may sound silly, but, you know, you never know what you're going to – <clears throat> pick up from reading a comic book in terms of influence or inspiration. Uh, read everything, magazine articles, newspapers. If you don't have at least one or two newspapers you read daily, then you're shortchanging yourself because you'd be surprised how many news stories can, you know, inspire something, inspire a poem, inspire a short story, maybe even a novel. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, give, I know reading is... It's kind of fallen out of favor in certain circles these days, but I'm a total proponent. Read anything and everything you can get your hands on. Are there certain publications that you recommend? I read I read a – this is just me. I read a daily newspaper every morning mm -hmm. before I start work because you never know what you're going to see. Um, I read comic books. We've got a comic book store nearby. I'll go there one, once or twice a month and pick up some comics. Um, right now I'm reading a, a book of – a, an investigative journalistic thing on the whole Trump Russia thing called Russian uh. Roulette. You want to read a, a solid piece of journalism, get Russian Roulette. It's only been out a short time, but this is what happens when two veteran journalists set their mind to something. And I know you'll, anybody who's remotely interested in doing, you know, journalism or nonfiction books or biographies, mm -hmm. it's a perfect book. It'll give you ideas, I guarantee it. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, I'm I'm going to check that out definitely. <laughs> like <Yeah>. yesterday. <laughs> check that out. Yeah, but uh, you know, the bottom line is <clears throat> excuse me. The bottom line is to just read. You know, read anything and everything. And then write anything and everything. I love that. And do you do you prefer to read like on the screen or or hard copy? Hard copy. I'm old school. I will I will, you know, if I have to I'm doing research then, you know, I'm on the computer, but I've got a stack of books by my bed right now that's about 20 high, and they're all real books. Mm -hmm. And I'm sitting here in my office right now, and I've got about 8 to 10 shelves. I'm also a book collector, too, so it, it's kind of a one of those things. But uh, I've got books. I'm surrounded by books. And for me, that's the way to go. I'm, the, You know, people want to read, you know, off their Kindle or all that. That's fine, too. I know it's the way of the world now. But uh, like I said, I'm old school. I like the idea of holding something physical in my hands. Absolutely. Okay. Mark Shapiro, everyone. Wow. You have poetry collection coming out, um, short stories, the Senator McCain book that's going to be coming out. Um, am I missing anything, Mark? Well, if you got 10 minutes, I've written it over 80 books. So. <laughs> over 80 uh, I, books. Ooh. I would say you've probably got the most recent stuff right now. Uh, again, uh, the Hey Joe book I is was a personal favorite. Uh, I had I, writing about Mary Tyler Moore. It, the approach I took, I think, was probably interesting too. But uh, you know, just uh, Amazon.com. 
and punch in my name and if it's something that strikes your fancy go for it yes definitely go for it listeners yeah mark when i said that i i meant like in terms i should have clarified i meant in terms of you know your upcoming projects you know that are that are coming up well i would say i would say probably you know the lin-manuel miranda book is is out there now get that Mm -hmm. uh the john mccain i'm not sure when they're going to be publishing that but if you if it'll help your cause i can get back to you and get you a publication date and uh you know buy if you're brave buy stories of high strangeness i guarantee uh it, there is probably some things that will cause you to not sleep well for a while Ooh. if you like being scared and if you like just having your mind blown uh, I'm one of these guys that's not necessarily the life of the party, but I have real strange thoughts. All right. All right. That, that's what I'm talking <laughs> about. And, and again, everyone, 80 books. And of course you need, that's the thing that I love about books. They always have life. So definitely check out what's already out there from Mark Shapiro. And Mark Shapiro, thank you so much for talking to So Booking Cool. It's been a pleasure. Would love to talk to you again in the future. And, yeah, do you have any final thoughts at all? Uh, no, this, this was a pleasure. I like doing these kind of interviews. It was far-ranging. I mean, we, we, I like that we we got the Lin-Manuel Miranda book in there, but, you know, all the other stuff is fine. I'm willing to talk about anything. And what, maybe next time we can delve into some of the real dark sides of being a freelance writer. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you to all the listeners, and until next time, so booking cool.